Hello there, you absolute legends. Emma McElhinney here with Piss Off Perimenopause and the musings of a bullshit queenager. I am here to ruin your misconceptions about perimenopause, fat loss and kick midlife in the face. So if you think your 40s are a drag, think again. Because every week I am going to be stripping down the myths about perimenopause. I'm serving you raw, unfiltered truths about your health and smashing misconceptions about fat loss. And a whole lot more. So if you thought you knew midlife, you don't know the half of it. Aging is inevitable, but getting old is a choice. So buckle up, grab a glass of something yummy, and let's and get to it. Welcome to the next episode of Eat, Move, Win, and the musings of a bullshit queenager. Today we have a top-notch guest. So a couple of weeks ago, you might have heard the um, feminist filth author and today we're bringing sex back into the conversation so today we have the very lovely dr claire mccauley with us and she is going to be talking to us about sex can't wait so hi claire welcome hi emma thanks so much for having me i love the sounds of that what was the filth thing about so there's a girl you'll have to listen to that episode of the podcast I will. her name is claire duffy she's an author but she writes feminist porn basically oh. and it's she's um she's going under the tagline of the jackie collins of scotland and she is oh. sign up to her email list because you get a little snippet every week top notch totally that's <laughs> totally up my street brilliant <laughs> um right lovely claire tell us all about you who are you what's your background what you do so I am an oncology doctor, Emma. I treat people with breast cancer. And actually, that's how my interest in the menopause started, to be honest with you, to begin with, because as part of the treatment for patients who might have a hormone-sensitive breast cancer, we make them deliberately menopausal. And we might make them deliberately menopausal when they're 36 or 40. And even women who have been menopausal, we might make them extra menopausal with some of the treatment that we give them. And I realized that, that you know, this was a big deal. And, and more importantly, that there was a big impact on their sex life. And we weren't really talking about that. And then that then that made, made me think, well, this must be happening to regular women as well when they get to the perimenopause and menopausal phase of life. And I couldn't find anything about it. So that took me then to training in menopause care. And then it took me to deciding that I was going to train as a sex therapist, which is I did. And then I brought it all together in the unholy trinity of um, what I now call the pleasure possibility, which is I specialise in sex and the perimenopause and menopausal phase of life. And that's what I do now. I love it. And um, after doing quite a lot of searching, there are not many people like you. So I think it's just an incredible, like the ballsiness to go out there and talk about it, but also making it real life for real women. And it's not this kind of, we were talking in my group the other day about, you know, my mum, people's grannies aunties all talked about menopause as the change and it was all whispered about and like you don't talk about sex and you don't talk about that you feel shit and all of these things so being able to bring sex into the conversation is huge so I'm really excited to to hear all about it and it's, so, quite, it's difficult for people I think even just accepting that you know it can be difficult for people to talk about these things and if it was difficult when you were 25 it's going to be even more difficult now because now nothing quite works and you think you're broken and all the rest of it so it can be quite difficult for people so that's how I became known as Dr Dry Fanny on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> that's just that because I was prepared to stand up and say the thing you know how did um how did work colleagues or family or our friends react from you being Dr Claire the oncologist to all of a sudden starting talking about sexy time all over the internet so <laughs> my my dad said we can still just call you a doctor can't we and I'm like, oh, <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I'm still doing that too. I still see my breast cancer patients. I was doing this on the side. If that's just all too much for you, it's all too much for you. But there is something you've got to be able to overcome your own edges and your own squeamishness and your own, you know, shyness about all of these kind of things if you're going to put yourself out there and, and talk about sex. Mm. Um, I think it should be very different. And I wonder, actually, I, I look at my you know, my kids and the way that they talk about sex and it seems to be a wee bit easier, but certainly for those of us who were brought up, you know, kind of late 70s, 80s, um, you know, my sex education was I got a book from the Catholic bookshop. That was it. You know, so that must have been insightful. <laughs> I remember it as a completely black cover. That's what I remember about it. I know it's terrifying. So I think we're just, you know, we're of an age where it wasn't something that we talked about. Um, it, we maybe even not talk about it even with our closest friends. And then, as I say, when things start to maybe just be not quite the same, nobody's told us one that it's going to happen and hopefully we're going to you know we're going to make some of that information available to people today so they know what's coming um 
And we think we're broken and we think that somehow we should be doing something different. And as I say to people, I think we'll probably reach the age where we should stop shooting all over ourselves, you know. But we have this sense that in some ways we should be having the same experience that we were when we're 25. And then I say to people, how great was the sex you were having when you were 25? And they go, be shit. I was going, well, maybe there is an opportunity here to be having the best sex of your life ever. And that's what I aim for the people who work with me is that they're having the best sex of the life that they've ever had. I think it's um, it's all part of that identity thing, isn't it? Like you get into your mid forties, everything's changing, but at the same time you're kind of going, "Is this it?" And you start questioning everything, like your sex life, your libido, your level of desire, how you look, how you feel. So it just it rolls up into this huge big bubble, and it's it it's it doesn't become a thing unless you actually make it a thing and want to make it a better thing so I think as well a lot of these things creep up on us you know Mm -hmm. it's not like it's there one day there the next and it's obvious it's that there are sort of subtle changes or things and we're not sure and because we don't know what we're looking for we're not quite certain and you know so the number of women for example who will treat themselves for thrush four times before they have a conversation with me and I go that's not thrush that's vaginal atrophy you know those can because we don't know so um, the reason I'm out there talking about these kind of things is because people need to know what you know what you're what you know about. You don't need to be scared of. And once you know, you've got the opportunity to do something about it. Oh my God, the phrase vaginal atrophy is filling me with the absolute fear. Right, you you need to tell us more about that. But I hope that maybe comes in because I want to know what what is it that's happening during perimenopause and yeah. menopause that causes all these changes because we, we hear about all these different symptoms and I hate using the word symptoms of perimenopause because like I just it's not an illness it's yeah. it's not a disease but you know you've got libido you've got dryness atrophy yeah. like terrifying um, <laughs> like what is actually going on yeah down there they are all over that causes all this as uh, you know at the time of the menopause what is mainly happening over time is our estrogen levels are falling so our, our ovaries that produce oestrogen over time are producing less oestrogen. And at the perimenopause, it can be a wee bit hit and miss and all over the place, which is why we can have mood swings and all sorts of other things. So our oestrogen levels are declining over time. And that affects, there are oestrogen receptors on every cell in your body, your eyes, your mouth, your muscles, your heart, all sorts of bones, all sorts of places. But the places that are most exquisitely sensitive to oestrogen are the parts in your pants. So your vulva, your vagina, your bladder, um, and clitoris so those parts of our body are exquisitely sensitive to estrogen and they require estrogen to work at their best so as those levels of estrogen are declining those tissues that require estrogen to work well have less estrogen and they start to die off that's what the word atrophy means it means die off so your the tissue in your clitoris the tissue in your labia the cells within your vagina that secrete lubrication, they're all not working as well as they were before because they don't have the estrogen stimulus that they require to work well. So that means that yes, you might have less sensation. Yes, your labia might actually be shrinking. Yes, your clitoris might be disappearing. And yes, your fanny is dry. So (laughs) all of those things are things that are a normal physiological response to what is happening hormonally. Now, I'm not saying we should accept it because it's normal, but what I really want people to understand is that the things that are happening in your body are real. You are not making them up. You are not, that feels a bit, it is actually happening to you. And there are things we can do about it, but we can only do something about it if we really recognize and be with and understand that these things are real and they're really happening. And that can be difficult for people because most people don't haven't cultivated a relationship with their genitals you know if this was happening on your face you would notice because you're looking you're taking care you're worried about this wrinkle or that you know if we were most people haven't cultivated a relationship with their genitals such that they're looking so I say to women when was the last time you looked and people will say I've never looked (laughs) you're making a face Emma (laughs) oh my god I don't know I have looked not recently though Oh my goodness. So there's this idea of how do we know what's changed, what's different, if we don't actually know what normal is for us. And a lot of the work that I do with people is about cultivating a relationship with their with your genitals so that you look after them in the mm-hmm. same way that you would look after your face, for example. Because we are at the age where you need to moisturize your face and moisturize your fanny. It's just part and parcel of what happens with aging. Oh so God, I think we're gonna have to give us a full skincare regime <laughs> of our nethers. Yeah. 
So I think that, you know, even if all we convey on this podcast today is that these things are happening and about 50% of women are going to experience problems in their pants that are that are affecting their life. And did anyone ever tell you that that was going to be the case? No. So how do you know? So one in one in you know if you think of a, think of a bunch of your pals, half of them are having some kind of dryness, pain, sexual difficulty as part of their perimenopause and menopause experience. That um, as much that's as a lot of women. Wild. I know that is wild. So when oh no, there's too many thoughts running through my head just now. Oh my god. So I was going to ask does everybody experience issues? So you've explained that fifty percent. The other fifty percent. Do they still experience change, yes. but not issues? Well, it, I think like a lot of these things, the level to which it impacts you depends on lots of different things. So most women will experience some kind of change in lubrication, for example. Now, if you're going to go, oh, I feel a bit dry and I'll use lube and I don't have any shame feelings about using lube and it never bothers you, that's one thing. But for some people, because sexuality, the, the changes that come can trigger a lot of the shame experience we already had about sexuality, for example, then they're going to be much more significantly impacted by the change that's happening in the body, for example. And that, you know, there's all sorts of, um, but most people are going to experience some kind of change. Absolutely. The level to which you're impacted might be different. The level to which you might experience pain, the level to which you might experience it's an inconvenience um, will change depending on what you're willing to do about it, as in, do I feel proactive about this? Whether whether you consider that you are broken in some way and the whole mindset piece that comes with that um, and, and any treatment that you might choose to engage in, for example, because it is actually extremely easily treated. Wow. So that kind of leads me, so you've got all these physical things going on, but you've also got a drop in libido. Yeah. Now, is that libido change because of the physical things that are going on and it's like, this is uncomfortable or this is just not enjoyable anymore? Or is the libido thing something that's completely separate? So libido is extremely complex. And if libido were as simple as getting your hormones right, then we would all be having marvellous sex and not have any problems with sex when we were 28, right? So there's a there's a there's a important part for hormones to play here, but a bigger part of that is about our psychological, spiritual connection to ourselves, our body, to sexuality more widely. Um, and the libido piece is so multifactorial, particularly for those of us in female bodies, that yes, getting the hormone bits are right, but I can get the hormone bits right for people and it make no difference to the libido whatsoever for lots of different reasons. So firstly, what we know is when people report changes that they experience, people will tend to report changes in physical sensations first and libido a bit later in the process. Now you can see why those two things might be linked. If you're having pain that's not pleasant, then why would you want to have sex? So libido is simply our momentum towards having engaging in sexual activity. That's all it is. There's nothing more and nothing less to it. So yes, if you're having physical changes, why would you want to have sex? Because it's painful and all the rest of it. And you feel broken and you're not sure and you've nobody to talk to. And then the shame thing starts and all of those kind of things also feed into it. So there's that piece. There's also a big piece around stress. So our bodies cannot do stress and sexual arousal at the same time. They are, they are, they are totally differently wired in our brain. And stress, that's our kind of fight or flight response, will always win because that's the thing that's primed to keep us alive. Nobody ever died by not having an orgasm, right? So the sexual center, the sexual responses come separately to our stress responses. So if you are stressed for whatever reason, your work, your job, aging parents, teenagers, whatever it might be, then that will also have a significant impact on your libido. And it, often midlife is the time where we're the most stressed we've ever been. So yeah. our libido really hasn't got much of a chance. So there's that. So there's definitely the hormone changes. There's the other things that are going on in our life and our body. And the bit that I wanted, I love to talk about is that libido and desire isn't what we think it is. We know that what we imagine or what we are fed perhaps or what we're societally conditioned to think of it about desire and libido isn't what happens in female bodies. But you see... We have this sense that we're going to be spontaneously horny out of the blue while standing doing the washing up and be completely overcome by this overwhelming sense of wanting to have sex. <laughs> and that is simply, as we know from research, that simply isn't true. Now, that experience is called spontaneous desire. Something arises out of the blue and I want to have sex. And that's far more common in male bodies. 
Yeah. And it's far more common when we're younger and it's far more common at the beginnings of a relationship. So if you, by the time you're in midlife, you've been with a partner for a number of years, your, your chances of experience spontaneous desire out of the blue are actually quite small. But that's what we're waiting for. That's what we're imagining that we're going to be experiencing. So when people say my libido's gone, I say, what do you mean? That's what they describe. And I say, if you're waiting for a bolt of desire to the fanny, it's not coming. It isn't coming. That's not the way you are likely to experience desire in your body. And so if you're saying to me, my libido is gone and you're waiting for that and that's what you think it is, then we're on a tie into nothing. What we do know is, and I'll ask you, Emma, whether you've ever had this experience. Have you ever had the experience where you're thinking, oh God, here we go. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's just do it. Oh, actually this, oh, actually this feels okay. I'm licensed. This, oh, <laughs> oh, this feels good. Oh, why don't we do this more often? Have you ever had that experience? Oh God, absolutely. Right. So that is responsive desire so the idea so that we have spontaneous desire that arises out of nowhere for the vast majority of people in female bodies we experience responsive desire which means once we get things going we go oh actually this feels good on oh, then our desire kicks in now the reason that's really important is because we can then be intentional about it if we're waiting for something to come from the outside to make us feel horny or feel desire it's not coming but actually if you're intentional about it and you create the container and the circumstance the desire will arise. And that's called putting your body in the bed. So it's a bit like if you want bigger muscles, you need to go to the gym. If you want to have sex, you need to put your body in the bed because your desire will arise if you make room for it. And of course, when we're busy and we're stressed and we're midlife, we've got all these other things going on, we've got hot flushes and all the rest of it, we might be a bit less inclined to do that. And it moves further and further and further down the pecking order of things we're going to focus on. And as we move it down the pecking order, it's less and less at the forefront of our mind, the less likely we are to put our body in the bed and round and round and round. So what I would, the second thing, other than yes, you might have problems with your vagina and that's real and it's treatable. The second thing I really would like people to go away with is you can have whatever sex life you want and you will have to create it. If you're waiting for something to come from the outside, it's probably not coming. That is so interesting. And it does make absolute sense that if like I talk about reps, mental reps. If you uh -huh. want to change your behavior, you have to do the mental reps. If you yeah. want bigger butt cheeks, you're going to have to go and do hip thrusters. Yeah. If you want to go and have more sex and enjoy it, you're going to have to have more sex and yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. Like, it makes absolute perfect sense. That's yeah. incredible. And it's, it's a very similar kind of thing. You know, I think we have this sense that kind of sexuality is something beyond, you know, something that we are overcome with or um, suddenly, exp you know, it appears within us, but your sexuality is there all the time. You know, it, it really is, the life force energy is the thing that makes the plants grow. It's the things that make the bunnies shag in the springtime. It's the same thing and it's always there, but you have to know how to tap into it. So you have to learn how to be with it and tap into it. And you have to be looking out for it. You know, you have to be aware of looking for it in your body um, and creating the set of circumstances where that is likely to happen. Because when I say, right, okay, let's do this with you. What, why do people have sex? Why do you have sex? What is it that you want to get out of it? Connection, I think, is probably right. the biggest yeah. thing. Connection with a partner. Yeah. What else? That intimacy. I suppose yeah. that's the same as connection. Enjoyment. Like everybody loves an orgasm, don't they? Pleasure. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Part of it's habit as well. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially in longer term relationships, it's kind of like, well, kids are out. Yeah. We might as well, just do it. Uh -huh. Um. But yeah, they're probably the main There's thing. Lots of the, you know people. I'll ask that question. And people say it, it helps me sleep. It makes me feel better. Um, I feel a bit like it helps me manage my stress. Not When I say to people, why do you have sex? Nobody says, because I want to discharge the spontaneously arising desire in my body. That's not why we're doing it. You know, we're oh, I really hope somebody says that to you. <laughs> tell you about that. What? But we're wait, you know, we're waiting for this thing to happen to have sex when actually we want it to feel connected to our partner, to feel good in our bodies, um, to manage stress, to have an orgasm if that's what you want to do. They're the reasons that you want to do it. So put your body in the bed and the rest of it will happen, you know? Because I think this idea that we're waiting for it to come from the outside is a real misnomer. And that's fed to us by society. It's what we see on movies. It's, you know, it's what is kind of been sold to us. Is this what it should look like? But actually, what we've been sold is a very male-centric patriarchal view of what sex looks like and it's not like that for women where does body confidence come into libido yeah. then because one of the one of the big reasons that women work with me is because the physical changes that yeah. come and they don't recognize their body yeah. they've got this identity thing going on so that obviously has a knock-on effect to your levels of self-desire I suppose yeah. you're like well if I don't fancy myself yeah. how do I expect yeah. hobby partner whoever to fancy me where does that come in and how can we help 
so join the, the dots. The way that I think about this is, is that it's to focus entirely on pleasure. Your body can experience pleasure no matter what size it is, no matter what shape it is, no matter whether you've been to gym or whether you haven't been to the gym, is to focus on pleasure. This body we've been given is the most phenomenal pleasure experiencer you will ever come across. It is an amazing, I mean, I'm a doctor, so I love bodies, but you know, it is an amazing piece of machinery that has the most phenomenal capacity to experience pleasure. And it doesn't matter what size it is or what shape it is or what it looks like. We're been, again, it's another kind of societal thing about sexuality is about what we look like and what it looks like rather than actually what it feels like. So you can have pleasure in your body no matter what size it is. And if we move, if we take the focus away again from maybe desire and libido the way we've been fed it and we've been fed it that way because it makes people buy things let's not be let's be completely clear about it that's why we're fed the narrative of sex that we are because it sells stuff and we f switch it to pleasure and think okay well actually what pleasure can I experience in this body what pleasure can I allow this body to have and you know it's a bit you and you must see this all the time as well I mean, if you can't if you're if you if you're currently hating your body you might hate it a wee bit less when it's a different shape but you're unlikely to love it there's something about creating the love and the experience for your body and what it does for you and the experiences it's given you and the pleasure that it can give you. And if we can focus on cultivating a self-love and a self-pleasure, then the rest of it will come. Mm -hmm. Literally, the rest of it will come. <laughs> it will. That's, um, it makes so much sense, doesn't it? Because I mean, I always say that as well, like, I'll be more confident when I've lost a dress yeah. size too. Like, yeah. you probably won't. Yeah. Like, you have to do the inner work to get yeah. the confidence. The body is just the outer shell of, yeah. of how you're feeling. Um, so, right, let's go back to the discomfort part yeah. and we can, hopefully you can share some like ideas of how to help it. One question I had, HRT, right? Everybody and their auntie is clamoring their GP for HRT. Does that help, or even the contraceptive pill, right? Yeah, Does yeah. that help or detract from libido and or dryness? Right. So let's deal with those two things, the kind of libido piece separately to the dryness piece. So for those people who choose to use full HRT, right? So that's patches or gel or tablets or whatever. Or if you're perimenopausal and your GP suggests the pill, that's essentially the same thing, okay? You're actually getting a higher dose of estrogen with the pill than you would do with standard HRT. But let's just take that all in the one bracket. So even women who are using full HRT, about 25% of them, so one in four, will still have the vaginal problems even on HRT. Right. So, yes, HRT does help a significant proportion of people who choose to take it may not get those symptoms. But even women who do one in four will still have the vaginal problem. And that's where local vaginal estrogens come into play. And you can have local vaginal estrogen whether you want to take full HRT or not. So if, if there's people listening whose main problem is vaginal dryness and they're not necessarily bothered with hot flushes and all the other things and don't put or choose not to take full HRT or can't have for some reason, then you can still use vaginal estrogens. And that's using vaginal tablets and creams locally in the vagina. And it is incredibly effective, oh, incredibly wow. effective. So it can take anything up to about 12 weeks to get its full effect. But because those tissues are so sensitive to estrogen, you're delivering the estrogen locally, either in a little tablet that you use in the vagina or creams or both, which is usually what I suggest to people. Um, then usually the tissues will um, re respond very quickly. But what I say to people is the when we talk about the perimenopause and menopause, many of the things that we talk about, like hot flushes and night sweats and brain fog and all that stuff will get better with time. This is a kind of transition phase and then it will get better and it might disappear with time. Vaginal atrophy will not. It will get worse with time if you have it. So I say to people, if you are having this and you're maybe not quite sure, oh, it's a bit nippy or it's a bit dry or it's a bit sore when I have sex or whatever, um, the earlier you treat that, the less tissue you will lose and once you start that treatment, it's likely to be a lifelong treatment for as long as you want those bits of your anatomy to work. Um, because when you stop it again, it's likely that the same thing will happen. So uh, knowing about vintage of vaginal atrophy is really important because you want to deal with it as early as you can. Oh, wow. So yes, HRT will work for some people if they're choosing to go on HRT for other reasons. Yes, it will work for some people, but there will still be one in four people using HRT who will need additional support for their vaginal symptoms. And can they get stuff like like topical stuff over the counters or things that you oh, would recommend? Or 
Yeah. So when we think about vaginal dryness, for me, there's three three main things that we're thinking about. So we'll talk about non-hormonal things and hormonal things. So the first non-hormonal is vaginal moisturizers. You can buy moisturizers for your fanny, specifically designed for that purpose. Please and let the, it be called oil of vag. That right. would be amazing. So I I say to people, you can either literally massage your genitals with any edible oil coconut oil olive oil sweet almond oil whatever it is you want and I I encourage people to touch their genitals to create this relationship piece with them that this is a part of your body that you want to look after so you can use oils coconut oils but normally what I tell people there are specialized vaginal moisturizers that you can buy over the counter or you can get on prescription and you use them kind of twice a week and they contain products like hyaluronic acid the same stuff that's in face cream and it helps the the skin within the the vagina itself to hold water to hold moisture so you they come in little tubes and you can squirt them and you can use them you can use them as often as you like but most people use them twice or three times a week so you can moisturize your fanny with any edible oil you like if you are perimenopausal and you there's a chance you might get pregnant because because that's the other thing is not to use oils when you use if you're relying on condoms for contraception for example but you know you can massage anything into your fanny that feels good for you basically so that's moisturizers and then the second aspect to that is lube so using lube when you're having penetrative intercourse um and a lot of people have got a lot of feelings about that or shame or i should just be wet enough or again a lot of this stuff that we're fed about how our bodies should respond um might be very different when you get to our age so finding a way to incorporate lube into your foreplay um that feels good you know and just making it part and parcel of your experience um so that's those two things they're the non-hormonal things moisturizing which we're doing every day or every other day and using lube so the other thing is what we've mentioned already is this vaginal estrogens so they are extremely effective and if you don't want to use HRT, you can use hormones just in your fanny. If you want to use them both together, you can also do that. But they're extremely effective. Now, they, they are mainly on prescription. However, there is a new product that's called Gina, I think it's called. And you can buy vaginal estrogen tablets over the counter wow. from pharmacists. I was going to ask, is that quite, um, like I get quite a lot of comments from women that have had a really hard time getting any anything prescribed from their their gp but is that like the vaginal estrogen is that quite a common thing for a gp to prescribe it is and i would again and i would say you like a lot of these things is that to go in you know i i try to say to people look i hear lots about i'm battling with my gp and i'm this and i'm that and all the rest of it in general terms your gp wants to work with you so the way to do that is to go in to be well informed you don't need to be arsy. You just say, this is what I would like to try. And most GPs will be very happy to give you what you want to try. So it doesn't need to be a battle, but educate yourself about what it is that you think is helpful for you. Now, your GP might say, we really need to check it's not something else first. And that is true. You know, we need to you know make sure you haven't got an infection or something else. And that's fine. But let your GP rule out other things, because if it is something else and you're treating the wrong thing, that's not helpful. Um, but, you know, to, to be informed yourself and just be clear about what it is that you would like to try and most gps are going to be perfectly happy with that and um, but yes you can buy it over the counter i say to people look you know i think it's about i think it's about 10 pounds for i forget a month's worth or something and i'm saying you get prescriptions free in scotland you don't need to go and pay for it you know you can go and pay for it if you want you don't have to um you know prescriptions are free and you're entitled to have this and sometimes i see people going down that route because they're too scared to go into the conversation or shy or embarrassed or shameful to go into the conversation with their gp but ultimately that's what your gp's for mm -hmm. and whatever it is that you've got or worried about he or she will have seen it <laughs> 110 <laughs> times worse yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely oh my goodness right so we're gonna have to wrap up but we could actually make this last week two more days. <laughs> okay, I've got so many more questions. Um, quick question about um, partners. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is about how do we talk to the other half about what is going on? You know, is it just a case of being really honest and being like knowing what's going on in your body and how you're feeling and having the conversation? Or is there any anything that they should know? Yeah, I think, so I think the first thing, and I, I say this to to women a lot, is your partner doesn't probably want to be having sex with you that's causing you pain. 
right? So I see a lot of people who do what I call duty sex because they think they should. They're having sex that they're not really enjoying. And I, I kind of say to them, if that was the other way around, you know, is that what you would want for your partner? And they're horrified. No, absolutely not. And I think it's, you know, I think we, 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 again, we're conditioned to believe that men need to have sex, that they want to have sex, that we should do it anyway, whether we want to. It's all bollocks. We're too old for all that nonsense. So I think the first thing is to think about it the other way around. If your partner was having some difficulties, what would you want from them? You know, what would you want? You would, I would assume that most people would want them to be honest. You would want to hold it gently. You would want to find a way through. And in my experience, that's what most partners want to do. They want to help you um, create something together that works now. So, and they can only do that if you're honest about what your experience is, you know? And, you know, I hear a lot of male partners that I talk to, um, they feel quite shut out, you know, they're having the same thoughts. Does she just not fancy me anymore? Is it my body? Is it because I'm old? You know, is it because I'm balding? Whatever it might be, you know, they're having their own experience of some of that on the other side of also not having the connection with you. So it's, for me, it's about just being really, really honest. This is what's happening for me. I'm not wedded to this as their own way, and I would like to work with you, and I've learned this new thing. So if this is the first time people listening to you have ever heard about spontaneous and responsive desire, go and Google it together and go, oh my God, we never knew this. How do we make this work for us? Um, but your partner can't know if you don't tell them. And, you know, that talking about, sex, you know, how, how we do one thing is how we do everything, right? So how we are communicating around our sex life is probably how we're also communicating around other things. And sex can be a really difficult topic if we're not clear and centred and feel good about it in our own bodies. It can feel really difficult to bring up. And your partner might also feel the same. But this piece about connection and intimacy and all the rest of it, that's where the true connection and intimacy comes from, from being vulnerable with your partner and saying, this is, you know, this is really bothering me or I'm having difficulty with it and finding a way to work with it together. But your partner can't do that if you don't tell them. Yeah, very good point, Claire. Right, tell us, how can, I think you're just going to have a flurry of new followers. <laughs> so tell us, where, where can we find you? What resources have you got out there that people can read or how can they work with you? Let's hear it all. Of course, so I have a Facebook group that's called The Pleasure Possibility that's free and it's full of women who want to come and talk about I'm having this difficulty and share their wins. That's the bit I love about it most. You know, people come, they'll get a little bit of advice or I'll give them something to try and they'll come back and go, oh my God, that really worked. You know, it's a, it's a very positive space to come and create an experience. So it's called The Pleasure Possibility. You can find me on Facebook. Anybody who would like to join is welcome. Um, I've just done, um, I've just made available actually to people I like, like you and your followers, <laughs> a free webinar that goes into a lot of these things in a lot more detail. If people want to sign up for that, we can put that in the, they can get that in the notes below if they want to sign up to see that webinar. It's about an hour and a half of all of this stuff if people want to come. And if they want to come and join the Facebook group, it would be lovely to see them there. They're very welcome. And if the, people want to work with me, again, you'll get me via any of those routes, Pleasure Possibility or the thepleasurepossibility.com is my website where you can find me. Fabulous. Thank you very much. That was absolutely amazing. And I think so many people, even given having the permission that A, you're normal, these things do happen. And, you know, there are solutions. You don't have to suffer. I think that's just really important for people to know. So, yeah, go and look up The Pleasure Possibility. You'll find loads of resources there. Thank you very much for coming along today, Claire. It's been amazing. And we'll be speaking again very soon. Yay! And just like that, we have spiced up another episode of Piss Off Perimenopause and the Musings of a Bullshit Queenager. Massive shout out and a huge thank you for hanging out with me today. I really hope you've been entertained. And remember, don't be shy, hit that subscribe button. And until next time, keep those heels high and standards higher. Remember, it's all about glowing, growing and downright owning it. So catch you on the flip side and don't forget to click the link in the show